Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the medical track today. My name is Petya Rudlov and I'm senior sales manager. I'm in charge of the medical customers in the DACH region. DACH stands for Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And I guess you have heard in the keynote speech of our CEO yesterday, medical is becoming a very important uh, area for the cute company. We are going to invest um, a lot of money um, in um, developing new features. And that is why I'm very happy to welcome our new product manager who is in charge of medical customers, who flew over from Boston all the way here. Um, Roger Mazzella, who has been working in the medical industry for 15 years now. And he's going to tell you more about um, our strategy for the future for, for medical devices customers. Before I hand over to Roger, I would like a question which might sound a bit stupid, but still I think it's worth asking. How many of you work in the medical industry? Can you please raise your hands? There are still people who are not working in the medical industry. So you're here just out of curiosity? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, I I'm happy to welcome to the floor uh, Roger Mazzella, our medical guru, who is going to tell us more about our medical strategy. Please give a big applause to Roger. Thank you. Thanks, Petya, and uh, thank you everyone for coming down to the basement. Uh, they tucked us away, maybe because my picture on the website, they said, I ah, will put that guy in the back all the way in the basement. Um, so I appreciate you coming. I appreciate everyone for attending the, the seminar, um, the uh, Cute World Summit the last two days. Hopefully you're having an enjoyable time. So as Petya said, our, our strategy in the medical industry is growing. Um, Cute, as you may know, has had a long history in the medical industry. In fact, what I learned coming on to this position is one of the first devices that Cute was embedded in was an actual um, uh, ultrasound machine. So that was over 20 years ago. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, customers and a lot of great partners working in the medical industry on our behalf. However, it was time to really form a strategy. Okay, it was, it was really kind of disorganized a little bit within the industry. So they brought me on board. As Petra said, I've had 15 years uh, experience in the medical industry working in exactly the same type of role uh, with a, a companies that supplied either services or product to medical device manufacturers. So this is very familiar to me. And some of the strategies that I'm starting to implement here at Qt, I, I've done before. So pretty confident in the success um, of the type of programs we're trying to do here at Qt. So I saw, I'm, I'm actually glad Petya asked how many people were involved in the medical industry. Um, I know there were some people that didn't raise their hands. So I just want to kind of give a summary of what's happening in the medical device industry today. So first, since we're in Europe, we'll start with the EU. So the first time in about gee, 20 to 25 years, there's been a complete overhaul of the European Union's uh, medical device uh, registration process. Um, so now the MDR, which just entered into force in May of 2017, um, Medical device manufacturers have a three-year transition period to update all their technical documentation processes and procedures. So products that are on the market currently have got to be updated to comply with the new medical device regulation standard. Three years is not a long time. In fact, we were at a, a medical, the MedTech conference run by AdvoMed two weeks ago, and there was a whole track on this, and they asked for a show of hands. How many people have started working on this? And there were like half the room. And the gentleman said, the other half of the room, you guys got a short timeline to get this stuff done. Because if they don't comply within three years, products have to be uh, you know, considered to be taken off the market because they must comply with a three-year transition period. There's major changes in the following areas. The real big thing is a stricter post-market review of high-risk devices. Post-market meaning after the device is already on the market, they're going to be audited to see how they're performing in the marketplace. So a stricter post-market review. Um, also, um, strengthened designation criteria for notified bodies. So the notified bodies are now more of your big-time notified bodies, BSI, Intertech, uh, the different TUV companies. Kind of like the, lack of a better word, mom and pop notified bodies are kind of being phased out. Um, so it's more of the, the really the, de the ones designated by the MDR and by the EU are the ones that are going to be able to certify uh, to the registration. 
um, the, the new regulation, excuse me, <coughs> improve traceability, and there's now a risk-based classifications for in vitro diagnostics. So no longer will IVDs be classified under the general medical device regulation. There's a separate uh, risk-based classification for IVDs. So that's what's happening in the European Union. In the USA, um, there's a huge uh, new program. It's called the PreCert program. Now, so for many of you who travel in the United States who are United States citizens, you know there's a TSA pre-check. For those of you in Europe, we as citizens in the United States can get a background check and actually have a reduced um, security check at airports because we are not criminals and you know we have a clean background and whatnot. So the FDA stole this kind of thought process or borrowed it, and now with their pre-cert program, they are going to pre-certify companies to give them a, a, a more streamlined path to certify or for, for software certification, digital health certification. So why are the pre-cert program? So traditional regulatory approaches for higher risk hardware-based medical devices are not well suited for software products, okay? So right now, software products, hardware products, they're all under the same regulatory approach by the FDA. They're looked at the same way. But software, as everyone knows here, has a faster and iterative design development and validation. So what happens? Software progresses much farther than the overall hardware device, but currently, the way the FDA looks at it is you make a change, you change your software, there's a possibility to recertify the whole device. That is a really huge effort. That's a huge undertaking, both from a time standpoint and from a monetary standpoint. So now with the, C, the, the software pre-cert program, there's going to be a more straightforward, more streamlined way to bring these software iterations to market within your devices. Okay, the device itself that has software or software as a medical device separately. So regulating this technology at the software and technology developer, not primarily at the product. So the FDA traditionally looks at the product, but under this program, the, the developer is gonna be looked at. They're gonna be pre-certified so that the products that they bring to market, depending on the risk of the software change, can, be, can go through a more straightforward, streamlined process to get to market faster. So the goals of this program to allow software iterations and changes to occur in a timely fashion, to ensure higher quality medical product software by companies demonstrating their uh, CQOE, which is the, um, uh, I gotta get that, that, that right, it's the uh, current quality uh, uh, overriding and effectiveness of their uh, processes. So their, um, their, quality, their quality system, their quality management system is, um, is know, at a very high level. And then a program that learns and adapts and can learn and adjust to key elements. Um, so as this program and as digital health expands and technology expands, the program can adjust so it's not as restrictive as technology evolves. There's a big thing in cybersecurity. And last night, thanks to Petchy, I had about 20 meetings yesterday. And uh, during those meetings, you know, this, this uh, increased awareness of cybersecurity uh, and, and what the FDA is putting out guidances on cybersecurity uh, within digital health products. Um, so there was a uh, post-market cybersecurity guidance that was published on December 26th of, of last year. This follows a pre-market cybersecurity guidance published in October 2014. So pre-market, before the product goes out, the FDA, FDA has provided guidance in 2014 on ways to develop and, and be aware of and be cognizant of uh, cybersecurity risks. That followed up with now the post-market guidance. So after the product is on the market, what you need to do, what you need to be aware of. So cyber, cybersecurity requests require both pre-market and post-market identification, assessment, classification, and steps to be taken to mitigate the risk of, of you know, uh, cybersecurity breaches. Another huge opportunity and huge growth within the medical industry is the Internet of Medical Things. Uh, so you know of the Internet of Things, 
the transmission, transfer of data and information between things. Those things are within a connected ecosystem, but the internet of medical things include medical devices and, and clinical system. So the data itself falls under, you know, um, uh, USA HIPAA uh, privacy requirements, which were established in 1996. Uh, the EU regulation also protects personal uh, data, and that was established in May of 2016. The growth of this industry, uh, it's $22.5 billion in 2016. It's expected to grow to $72 billion by 2021, with a uh, compound annual growth rate of 26.2%. That is a huge growth uh, within this segment of the industry. With the Internet of Medical Things, there are some things to be, be aware of. Cybersecurity, obviously. Um, so patient safety can be compromised if cybersecurity is breached within any device. And also the privacy can be compromised. So you can take and extract patient information, health information by the patient. Of course, the, the, the most risky one is the, the safety of a patient. If, if, if the security of a, of a device is breached, um, the device could be changed in a way that uh, a patient's safety is, is really at risk. That's the worst case scenario. Patient privacy, there's some legal ramifications to that. But then the other thing that people kind of lose sight of or may lose sight of is the data integrity. So not only does the data have to be secure, but it has to be accurate. So uh, the medical data to diagnose and, and treat patients is extremely sensitive and must be accurate. Bad data puts patient, safety's, uh, patient safety at a health risk and, and, and potential incorrect diagnosis coupled with incorrect treatment. So as you know, you know we, the, the talk is about treating more and more of our patients as the bulk of our population gets to be you know, over 60, um, trying to treat them more at home. One of the challenges is if they're being treated at home or outside of a hospital, but you want to be treated outside of a hospital because the cost starts decreasing, the cost to treat someone in a hospital is much more expensive than treating them outside the hospital in the home. But the problem is, is that when you get outside of a hospital, you get less and less um, nurses, doctors, people who are specialists in, in running the medical devices, caring for the patient. So I use this example. If we're taking blood pressure measurements, and there's a blood pressure cuff. If I cross my feet, bad data. If my hand is raised elevated above my head, bad data. So if the nurse is there sitting by the bedside, excuse me, ma'am, mister, can you put your arm down? Can you not cross your feet? We can, we can monitor that. But the more and more this is being done in the home or outside of an expert's purview, then what can happen is, is you can have bad data. That bad data could lead to incorrect diagnosis, incorrect treatment. So we have to be cognizant of that. So there are challenges, but there are opportunities within the space. So in general, the regulation standards are consistently evolving, as we discussed. Um, you know, there's a, an encouragement and a go-to market with initiative and state-of-the-art in, in our technology. So we want to continue within the regulated environment. We want to continue to encourage innovative and state-of-the-art technology and also make it affordable. Okay. So one of the strategies that I've brought to the company as I entered is, is this idea of compliance and certification. So medical, the medical industry is the second most regulated industry in all the world. Does anyone know who the number one industry that's regulated? Military, Military close. Okay. Aerospace, airplanes, right. So every part of an airplane, the, the nuts, the bolts, everything has got to be checked and it's really tightly regulated. That's number one. That's number two, and military falls into that because of the, the airlines and the aerospace uh, technology. But that's, a, that's the most regulated industry, medical is second. So at present, as I mentioned, we have a rich history in medical device development, cute within medical devices. We have a number of, of strategic customers currently, and we're bringing them on more and more every day. Um, so we do have a very robust development quality assurance processes, risk mitigation processes. We are ISO 9001-2008 certified, and we fully support our customers' global certification and compliance efforts. So what you as the customer needs to provide to the FDA, if it's test validation reports, um, uh, information regarding our processes and procedures, we are very transparent. We can provide that to you. Um, so that's immediate support for um, 
US FDA cert, uh, 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 submissions, EU submissions, ISO, IEC, and many others. As I mentioned, we provide the documentation, uh, source code, QA practice, test reports, uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, per request, and we work with tri providing transparency into our process and procedures. We are a commercial off-the-shelf software, and we want to be clear soup. So software of unknown province, but, but if we're clear, that means we're very transpa transparent in our processes. Where are we going? So for safety critical systems, and you probably have heard some talks the last day or so on the safety renderer. Um, for safety critical systems, the safety renderer has been implemented, and it's closely integrated to the QT tool chain, providing easy way to provide safety critical content uh, by designers. Um, it could be used in parallel with traditional tools on the same display. It's really uh, developed to show safety critical content, um, and then the main user interface shows the non-safety critical content. And the QT safe renderer will be certified to IEC 61508, which is the functional safety standard, ISO 26262, which is the automotive standard, and 62304 um, by December 2017, so by the end of the year. So we have non-medical device certifications. 9001 currently will be updated to 2015 from the current standard, we will be, the safety critical tools and components will be 61508 certified. Our medical device specific compliance. So we will be 62304 certified. TUV Nord will be our notified body. And again, it's for those same certification of safety critical tools and components in process. There will be a, what's called a normative reference to ISO 14971. So within the 62304 uh, standard. It says we must have a risk mitigation uh, process or risk mitigation plan that is compliant with 14971. So we have a reference back to that standard. And we're on track again to complete this by December. And here's the big thing. The medical device industry does not require CUTE to certify or comply with any of the above standards. And what I mean is this one right here. Sorry, I gotta, I've got to have a pointer. 62304. Whoops. That one, or 14971. There's no, there is no requirement for a software vendor to be certified. So the big question is, why do it? I get asked that all the time. So I've had some experience with this in the past. If you look to the American standard, uh, national standards who adopted and publishes this standard, they say the following. 62304 applies to development and maintenance of medical software, and when software is itself a medical device, or when software is an embedded or integral part of the final medical device, that's what I see CUTE as. We are an embedded or integral part of the final medical device. So the American National Standard says that this, although we're not required to certify, that this does apply. So from there, Companies working with medical device manufacturers should hold safety, quality, and risk mitigation processes to the same literal standard as medical device manufacturers. So if we go in and we talk to our customers, and I look a customer in the eye and I say, you know, we look at, we hold to the same importance, device uh, safety, effectiveness, quality, risk, at the same importance level as you do. The customer will look at me and say two words. Those two words are prove it. So if we say, okay, we have processes, we are following the same standards within the uh, same processes within the standard that you are. Okay, we're holding ourselves again to literally the same standard that you're, hold, you're being held to. We harmonize those processes together. There's the proof. From this, and when I've done this in the past, I've heard from customers that initial international market clearance efforts, so when you're going for your market clearance in the EU and the US and all over the world, will be more seamless and straightforward because there's a vendor file that they're going to have, that you're going to have with Qt. And when you open it up and you see the certifications, they start looking at it and going, okay, you're working with the right type of people. You're working with vendors that understand our environment and understand the medical industry. 
So those are more seamless. There's where we start really adding to that get to market faster value that we talk about when you use Qt to develop, right? You could develop faster. Well, in our support and our certification, our compliance, we help you get to market faster because these, these international market clearance efforts from our experience, from my personal experience working with other companies, hearing from my customers is more stream, seamless and straightforward. The post-market activities and audits will be quicker and less painful also. Because I've heard from my customers in the past that I've worked with that they go through an audit, and they go through and they see the vendor file, and they look and they say, these guys have their act together. What's next? I actually heard that from a customer. And they said that typically they would be under you know, scrutiny of their vendors, each vendor for like a day. When they took a look for 15, 20 minutes and looked through all the, the paperwork and said, okay, let's look at the next vendor that saved time, money, headache, effort for them. So kind of sharing that burden with our, with, our, with our customers. So we'll increase, obviously increase our credibility within the medical device industry. You folks who are in the medical device industry like to work with, with companies that understand the environment, understand the regulatory nature of environment, understand what is being asked of you from the FDA and the EU. We can be partners with you understand that environment, and not just think about solutions that stop at your door that you're going to pick up and develop upon. We want to start thinking about your customers, the patients, the doctors, the nurses, and how this passes through your development to those folks. And by you know looking at these standards, certifying to these standards, harmonizing our processes, we feel like we're doing that. So we want to clearly differentiate ourselves from our competition because as I know it right now, we are the only company that is looking at doing this uh, of other software of our kind. So this is a 62304 background. Um, I, I won't really go through this much, but just saying it, it, develop, it, it defines a software development lifecycle requirement for medical device software, so specific to medical device software. Um, it, it provides a common framework so for software developed for the medical device industry, again, this is not isolate the specific software sold directly to end users. There are applications for vendor software to be able to harmonize with the processes as well. So what this covers is development, risk management, configuration, problem resolution, and maintenance. So as I mentioned, within 62304, section 4.2 states that we'll apply a risk management process complying with 14971. So we're looking at not only the safety of the software that we're developing, especially that safety critical area, we're also looking at mitigating risk, taking risk to that lowest common denominator, the lowest point. Our, you know, the FDA and the EU look at risk and they say they're realistic. You're not going to eliminate risk 100%. However, can you eliminate as much risk as you can? And the risk that's there, can it be kind of uh, discussed, talked about, um, looked at at how you can avoid that risk, so forth. Um, so there's an aspect of 14971 that will be uh, uh, complied to and appropriate when we are certified to 62304. So although we're certified, there are two things that still hold true. Number one, Medical device manufacturers will still be required to comply and certify to these standards where applicable. So it does not preclude you as a medical device manufacturer from certifying because we've provided a framework where we've certified per certain aspects, but your development upon that framework needs to be certified. The other is that we are still going to be looked at as a commercial off the self software. So we still will provide required documentation for clear soup. So we're not doing the certifications to say, uh, we don't have to provide you with the test documentation anymore. We don't have to provide you with that transparency anymore. No, we still do, and we still will. But it gives you that kind of that, that confidence that we are really engaging the medical industry and, and diving deep into, into the industry and into the environment and understanding what it takes to, to play and work in this environment. So some of the other medical industry leadership that we've, uh, I've engaged with is looking at to be an industry advisor. So what we've done in the last six months, we are a full member of AdvaMed um, as part of the digital software and standards working group. So I actually work on those three working groups. And we'll give you a little bit of a background on AdvaMed in a second. We are a 
pre-qualified supplier for QMED, uh, and they have a pre-qualified suppliers directory uh, to the medical device and in vitro diagnostics industry, so we are a pre-qualified supplier of them. And we're also part of MassMedic, which is part of the Massachusetts. Now, we've just, I'm from the Boston office. We just opened a Boston office. There's a rich biotech community in Boston. Right, Doc Box? All right. So we're part of that community as well. So a little background on Avamed. It's funny, you know, being in Europe, I started talking to some customers yesterday about Avamed, and some people know about it, some people don't. But what Avamed is, is a trade association that leads the effort to advance medical technology in order to achieve healthier lives and healthier economies around the world. That is their mission statement. Um, they have nearly 300 members. They are global. 80 employees with a global presence in, in Europe, India, China, Brazil, and Japan, as well as the U.S., and the companies range from the smallest of companies to the largest of companies. And, and what, what, the, what the association really does, it provides a voice for the industry, for the manufacturers, uh, producing medical devices, diagnostic products, and health information systems. So what happens is, is that the FDA wants the perspective of the industry. They'll come to Advamed, look to the working groups to provide that voice of the industry, to provide what the industry is really needing what their perspective is, and that's where the working groups come into play. So we've been an uh, Avamed member as of August 2017. I had to submit an application. I had to do a number of meetings for us to become a member. It's a little bit strange because we're not a medical device manufacturer, but now they're starting to, Avamed is starting to include the types of vendors that supply the medical device manufacturer. So we're one of a few that are full members. And I, as I mentioned, we're a member of three working groups. So the Avamed Digital and Software Working Groups are really working on that pre-cert program I talked before. We had the Director of Digital Health for the FDA, Bakul Patel, on a few calls telling him or, or, or discussing with him the direction and the industry perspective on the pre-cert. Because what we have is right now we have a framework for that pre-cert. They've picked nine companies that will pilot that pre-cert program. But what they don't have is kind of the structure. What's the guidance? What's the classification system? How are we going to, um, you know, uh, 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 look at the companies, review the companies under what guidance and what classification system? Because they're not looking at class one, two, and three. They're actually looking at nine levels of classification for software. Okay, and we're trying to figure out with them how three, how the nine. The nine-point system classification works into class one, class two, class three devices. So, you know, these things are still being figured out as we speak. And I was actually just on a, uh, on a meeting the other day. So we're meeting like every month talking about this. So again, we're going to be sitting shoulder to shoulder, shaping critical policy issues that influence the business environment for, for digital health technologies and applications not only in the United States, but key global markets. They had a whole track at the Advent Conference on the MDR. So we're also looking at you know, the European concerns and, and the European registrations and, and that market as well. So it's not just focused on the FDA. And the members include you know, some of the biggest companies uh, in the world, J&J, &J, Medtronic, Baxter, Boston Scientific, Abbott. So these people are sitting on the, uh, on the different working groups, um, but also there are some smaller companies as well. Um, we're participating in educational seminars, networking events, with opportunities to speak on current industry issues and topics affecting the industry like I'm doing today. And we also exhibit at the conference a couple of weeks back. It was a really successful conference. MassMedic is like Advamed, but on the local Massachusetts level. Okay, so we are shaping policy within the Massachusetts biotech community and, and influencing it. Um, so they're just a great organization with a really rich biotech environment in the uh, northeast of, of the United States. So, you know, because we're local, we're, we're participating in the same fashion that we are with Advent with MassMedic. And we are an active associate member. So because we're not a medical device manufacturer, we cannot be a full member. But being a vendor, we could be an associate member. And there's, you know, network with over 350 members in that biotech community. So we're participating on the, the more local level and the more national and international level for the United States. We're also established some turnkey partnerships. I know there's some probably some development partners in the audience today, which we thoroughly enjoy working with. So when we need, when our customers needed the service to go ahead, okay, you could provide the framework, but we need help actually developing the user interface. 
We can do that internally at Qt, as you all know, but we also turn to our, our really strong partnerships. But I started bringing in some turnkey partnerships, and one of them is the Mergo Group. Now, what have I talked about so far in the first 20, 30 minutes? Regulation, 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 regulated environment. It only makes sense that when our customers need this type of help, that we have a turnkey partner to turn to. So I brought Mergo on. I've worked with them in the past. What a Mergo does is, is they are medical device regulatory and consultant and market access uh, consultants. So they can actually do your FDA certification. They can actually do your EU certification or you know, some of the larger companies turn to them because they may have a great team, a great regular team that specializes in, the, in Europe, in the US, but gee, when you need to get that submission to China, who knows the regulatory you know, environment in China? You know, some companies have those, that guy or that, that girl, some companies don't. So there's always uh, you know, a, a a la carte kind of uh, as you need uh, from market to market uh, um, resource that we can plug our customers into uh, for that that need. And they're great. I, I've worked with them for for years under different uh, companies that I worked with, and now they are a subsidiary of Underwriters Laboratory UL. As you know, UL they do a lot of the standards writing, um, so they're a really great industry leader. We want, so what happens is, is that I do these talks and I talk about regulatory and I talk in meetings with our customers about the regulatory environment and then people come to me and go, hey, how do I start my regulatory submission in the EU, in the FDA? And I go, I'm not a regulatory affairs guy. <laughs> um, there's too much liability for Qt as a company to advise our customers. We could tell you what we're doing. We can give you some of our experiences and share our experiences with our customers. But when we go to formal guidance, we have to kind of pump the brakes. But we don't want to leave our customers in alerts. We want to be able to plug you into those industry leaders that can help you. And Emergo is one of those type of, 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 of leaders. And we'll be looking for other turnkey partnerships. So again, not partnerships that specifically develop for the industry, develop software, but people that can help in these other areas. So we do have some customer success stories. Um, first, let's talk about some, let's summarize some of the values that we see with Qt, especially as it applies to medical device customers. So, first, as you may know, Qt is currently designed into FDA and EU certified medical devices currently on the market. Class two devices, especially class three devices, infusion pumps, imaging, uh, uh, medical robotics. We are currently, and then we have great use cases for that. So, Qt being part of these systems. Okay, being part of these devices, we're going through that stringent regulatory overview that you are as your device is getting you know, cleared for market in the US and, and the EU. We are a cross-platform development environment. As you know, this really hits home for the IoT and IOMT markets. As, we, as the, that segment of the market expands, we can support when you want your device to be talking to the cloud or sending clinical information to the cloud, to a workstation, to a tablet, to a mobile device. You know, we are suited and, and ramped up and geared up to be able to work within that cross-platform uh, environment. We support the compliance activity needs. As I mentioned, we will be certified. This one is the one that I think gets overlooked or kind of glossed over. So we can create, or we can allow you, the customer, to create modern user experiences with uncompromising performance and reliability. In the medical industry, in the medical device industry, that to me is really, really important because you gotta think, you know, I know we all develop and we all look at our great projects and our great products and very proud of what we put out there, but really, how does it work in real life? How does it work in that operating room? How does it work in that emergency room? So you have a nurse. She's in an emergency room. She has a patient that desperately needs help. They're bleeding. They're in pain. Their vitals are dropping. They need to get this patient stabilized. Does that nurse want to babysit that device? Does she want to worry about that device working? Does she want to worry about when she swipes that that gesture is going to react immediately and do what she needs? When she pushes the button on that touch screen to deliver that drug, does she want to have to sit there and watch it to make sure that that drug is being infused into the patient? No, she doesn't have the time. She wants to take care of the patient. 
the doctors, whole center of their universe is that patient on the table. So to be able to develop touchscreen user interface experiences that are reactive, responsive, safe, reliable, so that that nurse or that doctor can do their job and not worry about that device and worry about the patient, I think that's one of the biggest goals, and I'm sorry that I did not put that one up top. <laughs> Very passionate about that one, by the way. Um, so you can reach your market faster with best, best in class technology, with full tooling support and leading partnerships, and it's a secure software investment. <laughs> You know, we, as you all know, we have commercial licenses, we have open source uh, environment. You know, what we can uh, achieve and, and, and take from the open source environment, you know, this software is going to be around for a long time. There's a lot of contribution to this software. We're not going anywhere. We're making the investment. So it's a secure software investment for you, our customer. So we got about five minutes left before I want to open up to any questions. I want to go over a couple of use cases specific to the industry that we're very proud of. Um, so one, there's a company called Medic. They're out in Belgium. Um, there's an, they're an anesthesia and critical care workstation. So this is an anesthesia delivery machine. And typically, these machines are very uh, kind of mechanical. Uh, 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 rotary knobs and push buttons. Um, not so much with the interactive touchscreen. So what Medic created with Linux, I mean, uh, excuse me, with Qt on an embedded Linux kind of uh, workstation there is a new automatic ventilation system. Now, this is not just looking at it. You can see here, this is not just looking at the, the drug that's being, I mean, excuse me, the um, anesthesia that's being delivered or the oxygen or, or, or what's going into the person's airway. This is actually a full patient monitor. It's looking at the SpO2. It's looking at the heart rate. It's looking at everything. This was built on Qt, and when you see, and we have a video on our website, when you start looking at how they're manipulating this part of the 18.5-inch touchscreen, big touchscreen, um, all these can be reordered with a drag, so you touch, hold, drag, and drop, swiping gestures, um, opening up different areas here in a menu, um, lots of different um, gesturing and activity that goes on on this touchscreen, and uh, pretty neat because the doctor or the nurse can order, uh, you know, reorder what they want to look at and reprioritize what they want to look at. They may not want to look at the heart rate always up top. Um, so they are a front runner moder modernizing the ventilation system because they're using this touchscreen as opposed to the mechanical knobs. Um, and uh, again, I, I just talked about the numerous advanced features that any operator can control to monitor a patient with confidence. So not only is it really cool and really responsive, but they really developed a nice uh, working intuitive interface. Um, and, and Qt allowed them to do that. So if any of my friends from ICS are on here, so we partnered with ICS, and uh, they actually helped develop this really great infusion pump. Again, on the infusion pump market, there's a lot of fail-safes and a lot of rotary and mechanical design of the infusion pump. Um, however, they kind of changed the game a little bit and actually did this really nice uh, intuitive touchscreen. So it, there's delivery of advanced intravenous infusion management system. It's a smart infusion pump for efficient clinical use. Uh, it is a class three medical device. So it's certified FDA class three. Oh, by the way, this one is a class 2B in, in Europe, and they're in the process of getting their uh, FDA certification. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, so these guys are a class three medical device, a really intuitive user interface, similar to a smartphone. So does the nurse really go in and say, wow, this really works great for a medical device? No. What that nurse, that doctor is going to look at is, how does this compare to my smartphone? Is it reacting? Is it responding? Is it swiping properly? Um, and and that's, this is what's been developed here. So they chose Qt for the following reasons. Uh, Cross-platform development tool, um, known for its ability to create stable, flexible applications. Um, they want to increase product usability to system and system stability and safety while reducing costs and time to market. That was, their, that was their value that they got out of Qt. And they accelerated prototype development capabilities. You know, we have a prototyping tool, quick prototyping tool within Qt. So they utilized that to really fast get prototypes on the floor and test them to get their final device design. And my final slide, 
and then we'll open up for some questions if there are any, is Icona uh, did a, uh, a 3D imaging for, for wound scanning. So looking at wounds and, and, and classifying types of wounds and how serious they are. Um, so it's a handheld kind of wound imaging system. Um, it was developed with Qt. This little touch screen here was developed with Qt. It is both uh, a FDA class two and an EU class two A medical device. So it's on the market in both uh, the US and in Europe. Uh, provides clinicians with an objective and repeat of measure of volumes of wounds. Um, they built it with not only the device, uh, the desktop application, but also the embedded device uh, uh, product. And again, we help them significantly reduce product completion, time and focus uh, on an individual technology. So those are some of the use cases that we're very proud of and we're bringing more and more to the market every day. So I leave you with a really nice view of Boston. If you guys are ever in Boston, please feel free to visit the, uh, the cute offices. We're actually in the Seaport District. Uh, we, we have a really nice view of the airport and, and Boston. Um, and uh, I just want to open up the floor to any questions. We got about uh, five or 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Good question. So the question on the floor is, what kind of processes did we have to change in order to gain the certification? So we've had a couple of working, uh, working meetings with TUV. And the funny thing is, it's a paper push. We already have the validation. We already have a lot of the processes in place already okay for TUV to certify. So the answer is, is we're not changing a lot which means we're doing a lot right right now. It's just really organizing what we're doing and presenting it to TUV to certify. So as of today, and we still got another month or so that we're working with TUV in the certification efforts, but as of today, we haven't changed any processes. It's really collecting the paperwork and proving to them that what we're doing aligns with the different standards that we're trying to certify to. because I wasn't part of CUTE. <laughs> Great question, why didn't we do this five years ago? Okay, so what happens is, and, 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 the, the, uh, and, and the, the medical device, uh, the medical device industry is changing constantly, and that's why I put the first slides up to see what we're doing, and it's gonna change even more. Um, a lot of companies, it, it's an effort. Okay, it's a, it's a real effort. If any of you who are medical device manufacturers know what the efforts are, what your regulatory departments go through, or maybe what you invest in third parties to help you get your regulatory certifications and compliance to these different uh, uh, standards, it's an effort, monetarily and time, and it's a lot of paperwork. So a lot of companies that don't have to, won't. And they'll give the excuse that, hey, that's not on us, that's on you. You have to certify, we don't. Again, you know, this was kind of like 10, 10, 12 years ago, we start, I started with a company that did database software for regulatory affairs professionals. Okay, so we, we actually did, we were a competitor of Emergo, and we actually did the regulatory uh, consult, consultation and clinical. We ran the clinical trials. And then what happened was we found that there was a real archaic way that regulatory affairs people were tracking their submissions. They were doing it in spreadsheets and in, in file folders, and it was just so old tech. So we created a database management system where they can manage all their, their submissions all around the world in one place. But what we didn't do with that company is continue to certify to like a part 11 compliance where you know we're certifying the documentation that we're holding, okay? So we stopped short of putting these certifications in place, and guess how the business went? Okay, because we weren't listening to the needs of the industry. And then I worked for a translation firm specific to the medical industry. And we were the first translation firm to certify to ISO 1345. And as soon as we certified, and we certified through BSI, not a mom and pop, you know, uh, third, third party, uh, uh, you know, notified body. We, BSI is one of the top ones, one of the ones that's currently recognized in the new medical device regulation uh, for EU. <laughs> and I got phone calls. People were yelling at me. You cannot certify to ISO 1345. You don't have a medical product. So talk to BSI. They're the ones that certified us. We just provided them with the, the paperwork. And we didn't have to certify to ISO 1345. And we're the only service of its kind to do that. 
And what they did was they certified us to ISO 1345 to the parts that were applicable. The parts that weren't applicable was NA, and they certified us. And then that's where I got some of the feedback that, wait a second, you're really helping us out doing this type of certification on your end, and you don't have to. So that's where it started. From, from those two experiences, that's where this idea of what makes sense. Now, listen, as cute, we can go out and try to certify to ISO 1345. No way. It's not part of our business plan. You know, there's other things we could try to certify to or try to comply with, but it could be overkill. So what I looked at coming into this position is what makes sense. And we were getting a lot of feedback from our customers also that, hey, what are you, how are you handling 62304? How are you handling 62304? What are you doing about that? So there's also some feedback from the industry that led us in that direction. Great, no problem. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We're going to put you on mic so you're as loud as I am. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, there's no, so as far as I've read, there is no um, direction from the FDA or from the EU that says you have to do agile development versus any other type of development. There's no requirement on that. It's more of a best practice from within the software industry. So I think what the FDA looks at and what the EU looks at is, do you have a process for developing this? And they will look at something like agile development, which is really the, the, the becoming kind of the standard, right? And they say, okay, you have a great process for development. And by the way, is it traceable? And are you writing everything down? And is it, can you, can you supply, apply it to us? So the FDA and the EU stop short of directing you to say, you must do this. But they look at the process in general and say, is it repeatable? Is it traceable? Are you documenting it? You know what I mean? And can you do it over and over again? So that's my take on it. Yona is, is speaking later, and he's one of our developers. Um, maybe I can re-ask that question to you later and get your opinion on it. No, I can't. Oh, shoot. That, that's about the best I can answer it right now from my knowledge. I don't want to pretend I know more than I know. Um, but, you know, the, the, the FDA stops short in, in really directing, because they're not software developers. As much as we're not regulatory people, you know, we're not, I'm not a regulatory affairs guy. They're not software developers. So what they're looking for is reliability, repeatability. If you have a process, is that process documented? But they really don't say agile is the way you have to go. But being that it's almost, dare I say, industry standard, but very popular in the industry for software development, it's probably one of the better ways to go and one of the ones that they'll see over and over again as they look at different software developers. It's about the best I can do. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Oh, my, my friend from Docbox. Yeah, uh, so I know you said uh, a lot of your customers are um, looking towards contributing perhaps to a, a, a shared medical screen perhaps, but do you sure. are looking for customer feedback? Yes, sir. I'm curious if there was a, a, a timeline or some sort of a, a plan over the next you know, two to five years as to what that might look like? Did, you have any did, my, did, did my boss talk to you before this? Because he's been, he's been on me. So great question. I promise you that wasn't a plant. So great. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to mention it in, in, in my presentation and I forgot to. So yeah, customer feedback, right? Um, how are we going to get our customers to influence the, the, the further development of Qt and what Qt looks like in the future? We can't do it all ourselves. We can't work in a silo. That's why we're working within the AdvaMed and in the Mass Medic. But what I am doing is for our customers we're convening user groups. So I'm actually gonna convene a user group once every two months to start, because we wanna start getting these things in development if we identify these, these, these items for development quickly. So initially, we're gonna do one conference, uh, one web conference, to make it easier for everybody. Um, one web conference for the US and one web conference for the EU. And I'm looking to start that. My boss actually wanted me to start it this month, but with all the conferences going on, it's either going to start, we're either going to start sending invitations right after we get out of uh, the Cute World Summit and try to get something done either late October or November to get that first one kicked off. I want to kick off the first one before the end of the year, before the holidays. But we want to give, so there's two goals I have with those user groups. I've done this before with, with the software companies that I mentioned previously. Number one, we want to look at the tools and technology you're using within Qt 
and this is going to be medical device specific or medical specific customers. And I want to identify what you think the tools that we're already using, what you think is most beneficial to you. Okay. And I want to highlight those tools on our website because what I'm finding is when I go into these meetings is what you don't know, you don't know. Right? I, we go into these meetings and, and you know, we, we have some of our technical guys, like a Yona, we will sit there and go, hey, did you know you can use this tool or this library? And they're like, I had no idea. You guys are actually using um, our application manager and you stripped it from our automotive suite. Guess what? We're going to actually transfer that into a medical suite. There's also some DDS integration that we're looking at, not only for the automation suite, but we're also going to pull that into medical suites. So we've already started identifying with the help of the meeting that I went to at your location, we got some feedback from the customers, but that's getting individually to customers. So I'm on a community user group so that you, know, you guys as customers can share with us nothing IP, nothing secret, but what you're using, how you're using it. A, B, what, what are we missing? What do we need? What, what, what is, does the tool not have? What does the software not have? Tool library that you need to, to in the future. So thanks for the question. I appreciate it. I want to mention that. So we are looking to create a sort of a medical suite. And that might be borrowing stuff from our other suites that apply to medical and also looking at these user groups to kind of expand our features and functionality. So there's a development effort that's coming. I think that's all the time I have. I appreciate all of you for attending today. Thank you so much. A um, couple of things. Number one, we have medical data sheet. So it's kind of a summary of what we do uh, in, the medical, uh, in the medical space. So it's just a two-pager. So we welcome you to guys to take one of those before you leave. There's also a, a white paper that I wrote um, as well up in the front here. So if you are interested in it, uh, please take one. But, but thanks so much for attending. We appreciate you guys coming to our, our summit.